Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the first session on the third and final day of our conference. This is session six on education. My name is Melanie Horton. I'm a member of the Fulbright Association Board of Directors, and I'm also this year's conference chair. I hope everyone has been enjoying the conference so far over the last few days. Um, I know the last two days have been incredible for me, full of fascinating content and speakers, and really served as a reminder of how lucky we all are to be a part of this wonderful Fulbright community, especially now. And I'm excited uh, for what's ahead for all of us today. During this session, we will share three presentations. If you have questions for our panelists, please submit them in the Q&A function, and we will address them all at the um, after all of the presentations have concluded, so at the end of the session. I'm going to provide brief introductions for all of our panelists today, but I encourage you to visit our conference website for more information about all of the panelists to learn more about their accomplishments and the interesting work they're doing. Our first presenter will be Carolina Cuesta. She is a Fulbright Scholar and PhD student in learning design and technology at Purdue University in Indiana. She'll present a qualitative case study that explores the extent to which core courses in an online instructional design master's program encourage the development of creativity in students. Our next presentation team will consider how ethnographic research methodologies cultivate cultural understanding, promote racial and social justice, and advance civil and human rights. We have four presenters on this team. Kate Spano's PhD is a dancer, educator, and scholar who completed her postdoctoral US Scholar Fulbright in Brazil in 2018. Padmimi Buyan Bora is professor and head of Department of English Language Teaching at Gahadi University in India, and has just completed her Fulbright Teaching and Research Fellowship at the University of San Diego in California. Nancy Carvajal Medina is an EFL teacher educator in Colombia. She holds a PhD in cultural studies and social thought and education from Washington State University, and she is a Colombian Fulbright alumnus. Loneka Wilkinson Batiste is assistant professor of music education at the University of Tennessee. Her scholarly work centers on culturally responsive teaching and music education. Our last pre presenter today will be Ilio Leturia, and he will share a short documentary film, The Bewitching Hours, which portrays the CTA red line train in Chicago after midnight and addresses themes of systemic racism and social inequality. Ilio is an associate professor in the journalism program at Columbia College, Chicago. So with that, Carolina, I'll hand it over to you. You have 15 minutes. Thank you, Melanie. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to all the panelists and all the attendees in this uh, session. I'm going to share my screen right now. So do you see my presentation? Looks good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so well, again, good morning, everyone. So my name is Carolina Smelenice, and I'm a third year PhD student from Purdue University in a program that is called Learning Design and Technology. I want to thank the Fulbright Association for this opportunity uh, to share with you something that has become my passion and to share this space with all these great panelists. Also, I think that this topic like for me, it's very aligned with the conference theme and you know, it's creativity and we're gonna know and see why. So for this brief moment, I will share with you my research. Uh, we're gonna talk about what is creativity, some perspectives about creativity in and in instructional design, uh, something about my research approach, um, and some discussion for future research in this topic. So where, where does the world go from here? That's a very good question. I think we ask that question every day now. So maybe creativity is way to go. Let's see. According to the OCD and the World Economic Forum, creativity is one of the three most important 21st century skills and skills that employers look for um, in future professionals. So this is why governments and industry and educational institutions are starting to include in their policies, vision statements, mission statements, and curriculums, the need to develop creativity and creative thinking to solve complex problems of our society. 
And we know now that we have a lot of complex problems in our future. So, and I think they're right, right? Creativity among other skills like leadership, innovation, communication um, are gonna be very important for us in the future. And we need also creativity. So everybody talks about creativity. I think that you have, you've heard what is like, everybody's saying you have to be creative and we must be creative to solve problems. So what is creativity? There is no single standard definition of creativity. And that is why creativity can be understood as being a multidimensional construct involving cognitive variables, personality characteristics, educational aspects, and both social and cultural elements, right? So it is a fundamentally human characteristics. And with this, I say that creativity can be learned and can be taught. So one commonality in most of the definitions is that creativity involves the development of something new, useful, and valuable, right? And you must have this in mind, new, useful, and valuable. It could be something tangible like an object or intangible like ideas. Common elements discussed um, by most authors include the person who creates the cognitive processes involved in the creation of ideas, the product that results from the creative activity, and the social um, and environmental influence of um, the environment in the creative process. So it can be defined according to the research approach. If you're researching the process, the product, or the person. My research is focused uh, primarily on the process. Also important to note here is that creativity is expressed different in different domains. With this, I mean that creativity is domain specific, but we're gonna take a look at that uh, later on. So it's more probable that you are creative in a field where you are or where you're an expert or have some expertise that in another field. So why creativity in instructional design? As I told you, uh, my PhD is in instructional design. And well, first of all, um, the field of instructional design is that field where we create um, effective learning experiences. So we use learning theories, we use psychology, we use models, we use technologies, and we use tools to develop these learning experiences. So, um, and to improve quality of education, right? So who more interesting to uh, that ideas or instructional designers to evaluate if we are being creative or not, or if we are in our schools, they are teaching us to be creative. So some perspectives about creativity in instructional design is that over the past 25 years, some have criticized that ID or instructional design, this process is a linear process uh, that could limit creativity. And according to other design disciplines, creativity is considered an important skills or competency in those fields like um, architecture, engineering, fashion design, they consider creativity as an important um, skills. So what do we instructional designers think about creativity? That was my first question when I was in this program. So are we teaching novice instructional designers to be creative? How are we doing so or how does creativity looks like in instructional design? So among that question and other question, and after a lot of questions, I decided I decide to study to which extent um, creativity and creativity related activities are articulated in the syllabus of the core courses of an instructional design online master's programs. So to answer this question, I use a framework 
or I use a framework that, that is called the Componential Theory of Creativity. And this is a theoretical framework used to explain the creative process, how, how it happens, and the factors which may impact an individual level of creativity and how are these related. And you can see it here, like in this um, graph. One of the most widely utilized framework is this, and it's used to explain the creative process. So this framework says that there are three main factors that can influence the, cre the creative process or the creativity process. Dominant relevant skills, we talk about that you need to have expertise in a field if you want to be creative in that field. Um, creativity relevant skills or creativity relevant process or creative thinking skills, task motivation that needs to happen there, and um, this um, and the social environment plays a very big role in how this uh, creativity process is developing. So based on this theory, I adapted a tool that was uh, developed by Malcolm and Shaw, in which I categorized the creativity thinking skills, that is my focus of my research, on um, Activity, cognitive skills, activities that promote creativity, instructional strategies that promote creativity, and learning techniques that promote creativity, right? But other factors are needed to creativity to happen, but I wanted to first identify if in this core courses we have this uh, activities present. And I have here some examples of the tools like the creative skills, activities that promote creativity, some instructional strategies, and some learning techniques. So this was a case study, is a case study, because it's like on ongoing research. And my data sources are all the documents um, of the core courses. There are nine core courses in this master's program. And I did a content analysis of this document. And I also interviewed the lead instructors of this course to see and to relate uh, how creative practices are being included in the design of the activities of these courses. So some preliminary results is that um, I found that only three of the core courses mention the word creativity as explicitly, like the word. And this uh, explicit reference to creativity is more specific in terms of the instructor's expectations for creativity, like be creative, uh, step outside of the comfort zone, or I encourage you to think creatively, or feel free to be creative and innovative with this assignment. But the instructor um, doesn't talk about what is creativity and how can creativity be ex expressed in these core courses. Also, I found some frick, some creativity indicators more present than others. And, and one interesting thing is that the least frequency, frequently mentioned creativity indicators are the ones that are more related to creativity, like breaking perceptual sets, breaking cognitive set or using white categories. So the preliminary discussion for ending this uh, small conference is that creative skills are required by many disciplines today, not only in instructional design, but in education in general. But there is a lack of knowledge about how to assist students in their development, limiting both instructional methods and the students' deep learning about creative processes. And given the importance of fostering students' creativity in higher education, like specifically in instructional design, more empirical research is needed to understand the impact of using creativity-related activities in a student's creativity and teaching, including creativity as an explicit instruction in a student's creativity. So that is like the future of my research. Um, uh, if you have any more questions, we can discuss at the end. And this is my email if you want to write or ask more questions later. And that was the thing that I was going to share with you. Thank you very much.
Great, thank you so much, Carolina, for sharing that. Um, and yeah, excited to ask you some questions at the end of the session today. Okay, um, with that, we can move on to our next team of presenters, Kate, Padmini, Nancy, and Monica. You have 25 minutes. Great, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for coming today to this panel. Um, our panel, our mini panel within this larger panel is called Decolonial and Anti-Racist Practices in Ethnographic Fulbright Research. And I'm co-presenting with Padmini Borua, uh, Lonika Wilkinson-Batiste, and Nancy Carvajal Medina. So this interdisciplinary panel arises out of a series of ethnographic research wor workshops that I organized in partnership with Fulbridge and Fulbrighter Network over the past year. Each of us come together from different cultures and countries, including India, Colombia, and the US. And we come from different disciplines and career pathways. Through these workshops, we discovered that we share an, a worldview of the role of culture in ethnographic research. In this panel, we consider how ethnographic research methodologies cultivate cultural understanding, promote racial and social justice, and advance civil and human rights. Each of us will discuss how we implement decolonial and anti-racist ethnographic practices in our Fulbright research projects, which range from music and dance to language education and social issues like homelessness. We focus in, on embracing vulnerability in ethnographic research and reflecting on one's vacillating positionality between insider and outsider status. Our work acknowledges the funds of knowledge and indigenous epistemologies that are already present in marginalized communities. We also reflect on how we position ourselves not as experts in a hierarchical sense, but as constant learners within our communities of study. In my research as a dance ethnographer, I am particularly interested in how embodied research methodologies can be used to promote cultural understanding and community building. In short, this means that when I do my research, I dance. I get up and dance with the community that I'm studying and I experience what I like to call the quote, sweaty struggles of trying to move and also think in ways that may be unfamiliar to me. The work can be uncomfortable and vulnerable, but it's also exhilarating. I'm interested in the feedback loop between what people say and what they do, or in my research, also how they dance. This means that I alternate between ethnographic methodologies of participant observation and interviewing, and rather than try to reconcile any contradictions between what people say and what they do, I allow the research to sit with a multiplicity of voices and perspectives. In my dance research, I am interested in the embodied knowledges that dancers accumulate and share over time. Mm -hmm. I use the plural knowledges to emphasize those multiplicities in cultural expression. When I was on my Fulbright grant in Recife, Brazil, I studied a carnival dance called Frevo and other popular dances from the Brazilian Northeast. I attended carnival parties, parades, classes, concerts, lectures, and in particular, I worked with a dancer who taught me a dance from his community in the interior rural area of the state of Pernambuco, where I was, called Cavalo Marinho. Through his teaching, he showed me how the body has its own intelligence and speaks for itself. He always said, o corpo é tudo, or the body is everything in Portuguese. Mm -hmm. By this, he meant that the history of a community can be experienced through the body, and especially his community, which is poor, rural, and largely black or mestizo, whose histories have largely been unrecorded and devalued. As a white American woman, I know that I will never have the same experience as people from his community, but through his guidance, I was able to develop a sense of empathy and respect through the dance. It is one thing to read about a community and it is quite another to feel it in the body. In my scholarship about carnival dance, I find myself struggling to decolonize my own mind by balancing the expectations of quote, rigorous research in the academic community with the experiences of dancing and sweating with people in the streets during carnival. So much cannot and should not be verbalized and over intellectualization often leads to whitewashing of these histories. Again, the body is everything. What can we do to further recognize, promote, and valorize epistemologies of the body? Finally, I think there is an expectation that a Fulbright grant means that one becomes an expert in the host country. I can say that for me, spending six months in one city in Brazil focused on a very specific dance community did not make me an expert in Brazil by any means. But to me, the expertise is not about knowledge of the country itself or even the specific dance community that I studied, 
but about implementing these ethnographic and embodied methods for studying, studying a cultural expression. In turn, I can use that knowledge to share ideas about cultural expression and, um, and resistance and to promote social justice. As artists, scholars, and activists, we need to build this cultural competency to center community in our work and create spaces in which everyone, including the researcher, is continually learning and asking questions. In my research, quote, failure and discomfort, which can be discomfort in the dance or other discomforts that arise from linguistic or cultural misunderstandings are the key to learning. Thank you. And I will pass it to Padmini now. Thank you, Kate, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, good morning, good evening, and uh, namaskar to all my uh, Fulbright colleagues from across the world. And in these uh, five or six minutes, I'd like to share with you the one lesson that has stayed with me in all the cultural encounters that I have that have informed my ethnographic research as an English language educator, which is the value of othering myself and allowing myself to be culturally vulnerable. Uh, I'm just taking a second to share my screen now. All right, there we are. I hope you can see my screen. Uh, the Persian poet Rumi words teach us not to judge difference as dissonance. My cultural encounters in research have shown me that cultural morality or worldview are relative constructs because what I encounter in a cultural space is not a product of the, uh, a product of the moment but a flow in a historical continuum. The English that I speak, for example, is neither American nor British, and I'm aware that I have an Indian accent that some of you may not understand. But here I am, willing to be vulnerable, willing to learn and to grow, because allowing myself to be culturally vulnerable is an amazing research tool. As part of my Fulbright work at the University of San Diego, California last year, I quote out on a master's TESOL special um, topics in ESL course on supporting teacher candidates working alongside refugee background students. Our research project looked at ways of developing critical consciousness in our teacher candidates as they trained to support ethnic minority student groups in secondary and adult education. As part of their learning, our teacher candidates were engaged by the International Refugee Committee to offer after-school tutoring to refugee student populations in three school sites. And I volunteered to serve as a tutor in one of the school sites, becoming a participant observer. As an outsider who looked and spoke differently, I immediately became the object of polite curiosity. Uh, I let the teenagers stare at me, laugh at my ignorance, or bully me into writing their answers. I let them see that I was not the adult who held power. I was like them, an outsider. As they grew used to having me around, I began, to look, I began looking for opportunities to mention a certain book that I had read, a film that I had watched, or a conversation that I had had about some famous American. I would then mention a similar experience from my own culture. Gradually, I found myself answering questions on Bollywood, the music, the, sorry, the film industry, and India. Two students from Rwanda started playing Hindi movie songs on their phones and singing along, and they started asking me the meaning of the lyrics. The others hovered, not participating, but interested in my cultural gossip. I asked to learn a song from their uh, culture and soon they were laughing at my feeble attempts to learn their language, Kenya Rwanda. And the ice finally broke when I brought them a book in their language, which led to great excitement and uh, several claimants. I came to know only later that the book was about the art of making someone fall in love with you. Now, how did these cultural encounters, these lessons in vulnerability, connect to my ethnographic research. I found that my self-observation notes 
were generating the same codes that were showing up in my interviews and other data collection tools. I learned that by allowing myself to be vulnerable, I had made the students comfortable enough to share their stories with me. By doing that, I was validating their indigenous knowledge or knowledges. I was helping them look at themselves as more than English language learners. Hearing their stories was also crucial to my own development of critical consciousness. Only through this was I able to appreciate the deep rooted racial stereotyping, racial profiling, lowered academic expectations and other practices that had historically disallowed students from racial minorities from participating fully in their own academic development. I discovered that social justice began where I became the change I wanted to see. By accepting my own othering, I was creating a space for dialogue. I was allowing myself to participate in an ethnographic experience that bridged research and culture. I believe as an ethnographic researcher, I am as much my data source as my participants. That is what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you for a patient hearing. And I'm sorry that I'm reading from a piece of paper. I did not want to overstep my time. Thank you so much. Good morning. Um, my name is Lenika Wilkinson Batiste, and I am excited to be a part of this panel. I would like to present in a, in a format that's a little bit different from what I do for academic presentations. I'd like to bring you a little bit into my world to talk about why um, about this topic that's really important to me. So I don't have a, um, I haven't written out um, my presentation as my colleagues have, but I would like to talk about an experience I had that I call me Sinto em Casa. Which I said several times there, which is I know I'm in another country, but I also feel as if I'm at home. What made this experience interesting for me is that in all of my training about doing research, there was always a clear insider and outsider position that was discussed throughout all of the readings and all of the training that I had. My study was in Brazil, in Pernambuco, in a city. I was based in Recife, but I ended up spending, up, spending more time in Olinda, a neighboring smaller city. And once I got there, it was um, at getting adjusted to, to things. But despite the language barrier, I really felt as if I were at home in a lot of instances. That connection first began when I was at the cultural center I'm going to share my screen. That experience first began when I was at the cultural center for Grupo Bonga. Grupo Bonga is the group that I was studying the most. And while I was there, here at the center, I had weekly lessons on the drum. I'm a musician. I had weekly lessons on the drum. And one time there was another student there and we sat and we just talked about how they used their music and the struggles that they encountered there. And I began to realize that there was a similarity in my experience as an African-American woman living in America and their experiences as Afro-Brazilians living in Brazil. And I came to realize that that was based on a shared cultural heritage of ancestors that experienced slavery. To share a bit more about what made it feel familiar, outside of the university, I had um, experiences outside of this community. I had experiences at the university. Here is a group that was associated with the university performing a song. And I don't know that I shared my audio, so I'll reshare, making sure I share my computer sound. I'll play just the beginning of this. I think I'll play just the beginning of this. Uh-oh. Okay, so it's not going. But this song that they were performing is a song that one of my teachers wrote and that I had performed many times in the United States. Another thing that I noticed within the community is this. This is a news story that was done while I was there. I noticed that going to the cultural center, I had a lot of trouble getting there because the roads were um, really destroyed. 
Verina Paraíso, no bairro de São Benedito, em Olinda. Lá onde fica o terreno de Xambá, importante ponto turístico da cidade. Mas o acesso para chegar ao terreiro está bem complicado, com essas imagens que você está acompanhando. Essas fotos, nós recebemos o seu Nilson Barbosa, morador da rua Severina Paraíso. Ele e os vizinhos reclamam dos buracos, das valas abertas, das galerias. These were the conditions on the street, and often I would have an Uber driver come and tell me that they could not bring me there because of the condition of the streets. And they were talking about that and the darkness and how it created hazards for them. Well, this is the community that I grew up in. As the lad is born, I'll share that the, there were similarities between what we experienced with not having governmental uh, support and being able to live. So in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, the, where I'm from, it floods a lot. And there are structures in place that are supposed to combat that. But as you can see, these types of things were happening. Now, what? how does that relate to what we're doing here? The big takeaway for me is that the group that I studied used their music as a galvanizing community force. They came together, they performed, they had new shows dedicated to it. The segment that you saw on there for their community was 10 minutes long. And I came back a few weeks later and the streets had been taken care of at least to a degree where we could go through them. The flooding is still going on in Scotlandville, Louisiana. So, um, What my takeaway from this experience is that we can learn about issues that arise in similar contexts in the African diaspora. Also, I don't have to just clearly position myself as an insider or an outsider to any tradition. And these are um, ideologies that need to be challenged and rethought for different contexts. And also, I also agree with Kate that going out into another area and studying a music for a short period of time does not make me an expert. A friend of mine once said that at this point, I don't have all the answers, but I do ask better questions. And I do believe that this experience got me on the path to asking better questions, how we can inform each other's practices and come up with solutions to problems that arise in similar contexts. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be um, accompanying this space from Colombia. In La Kek, you are my other self. If I hurt you, I hurt myself. If I love you and respect you, I love and respect myself. I would like to start this dialogue by bringing the Mayan poll in to remind us that we are connected across time and space. With this presentation, I want to honor our ancestors, uh, the indigenous communities around the world, and in particular, the communities in Colombia that are walking the talk, caminando la palabra, in defense of life, democracy, justice, and peace. Having been to the US as a Fulbright doctoral student for five years allowed me to revisit layers of my identity as a human being under construction, a new mestiza, and a granddaughter of peasants in the Andean region of Colombia. Hands to the Soil speaks to the memory of a three-year-old girl uh, who would run into a potato field, kneel down, and scream, Hands to the Soil. I use this expression as a metaphor to speak about my process entering critical decolonial terrains. Today, I will share a part of the process by reading a letter I, wrote, I recently wrote to one of my mentors, Chicana Latina feminist, Gloria Ansaldúa. Estimada Maestra Gloria, hands to the soil, manos a la tierra. On a cloudy afternoon, distorted gray and red images graze from behind the shadows of those passing by. The images of the vibrating life of those gone way too soon were claiming for their voices to be heard. In front of that projection of life, we sat side by side in communion with the pain and love for those we didn't know. We remained silent while those projections of life left us with unresolved questions about the purpose of a greedy human existence. Dear Maestra Gloria, our 2017 dream encounter persists as the nightmare predestined by humans for Abiyajala, Mother Earth, to navigate. 
As I move in the midst of chaos and despair caused by massacres, police brutality, and the institutional shadow beast latent in Colombia's current government, I hear you say, it is exactly these times of this location, separation, that hold the promise of wholeness. As nations, we have experienced cycles of painful dislocation. The pandemic has exacerbated the conditions of inequity, rampant impunity, and injustice. Paralyzing is not the answer. We have to keep mobilizing our minds and hearts to create a fissure in the historical cycle of systemic oppression. As societies and communities, we have a long way to go in understanding our connections to our own selves, to one another, and Mother Earth. As a critical decolonizing human being under construction, I draw from my roots and experiences as the granddaughter of peasants to move in the world and envision possibilities for being and becoming. This is the process I call hands to the soil, manos a la tierra. The process of generating decolonial moments to reassess the values that fragment in order to tune up and nurture our individual and collective voices while engaging in loving actions of resilience and peace. Understanding that the colonial capitalist neoliberal truths constructed and sustained with the complicity of the academic and socioeconomic elites are some of the roots to chaos and despair has allowed me to explore decolonizing terrains. The truths of binaries that mediate relationships and the hierarchical distribution of worth of human beings place the vast majority of world citizens in the border of abnormalcy. Institutional and societal rhetoric used to depict the houseless, the immigrant, the undocumented, the indigenous, the African descendant, the differently abled, and the sexually diverse lie in the ground of the deviant. For this reason, I consider that the place in between the us versus them rhetoric constitute a fertile terrain to face the shadow beast as a resisting tool to dismantle, deconstruct, and reconstruct the stories and histories that make us who we are and who we may become. Walking into this first decolonial moment, I learned to be present and let go. Conducting a three critical ethnographic study on U.S. rural houselessness allowed Samantha and myself to meet in the halfway of uncertainty and self-doubt. My story is the only thing I own, said Samantha to me one day in 2014. Since then, these words resound in my mind, body, spirit, like a constant inquiring decolonizing bell into my responsibility with the communities I engage with. What right did I have to become one more burden in the lives of those whose identities were on the borderlands of non-normalcy? Gloria, you taught us, you taught us that, quote, borders are set up to define the places that are safe and unsafe to distinguish us from them, unquote. And that a borderland is a vague place inhabited by los atravesados, the abnormal. The label homeless represents a discursive border that encapsulates the other body in a terrain where his, her cognitive, ontological, spiritual, psychological, emotional, and political dimensions are erased. Bringing different layers of understanding about who we were allowed 13 and house people and myself to name ourselves to navigate the double consciousness of being and acting in the world, to deconstruct the American dream, and to create a new notion of a dream grounded on values like peace. Dear Maestra, my spiritual path is grounded on, as Elena states it, an understanding someone's or a community's position in the world by trying to make sense of unfair economic conditions and gender inequality and to do something about it. As a critical decolonizing scholar, I keep generating spaces to critically understand conditions of oppression, be hopeful and act. In critical dialogues of hope, youth, rural educators, indigenous communities and service teachers around the world will reunite in four spaces of dialogue to share our lived experiences and understandings on empathy, decolonizing the self, decolonizing the school and healing. I join you, Maestra Gloria, in your prayer. May the roaring force of our collective creativity heal the wounds of hate, ignorance, indifference, open our throats so we who fear speaking out raise our voices. We remember our dead, Gloria Ansaldúa, Elisa Facio, Maria Lugones, y tantas otras. Dear Gloria, it is my personal prayer that our bodies become our homes and our decolonial journeys bring us together for peace to become the utopia we can fulfill. 
rest in power, Maestra Gloria, and thank you everyone for listening to these ideas this morning. Great, thank you so much, Kate, Padmini, Lonika, and Nancy. Um, there are so many important takeaways from your research and presentations. Thank you for sharing um, and a reminder to everyone listening to please submit questions using the Q&A and we will get to them soon. I'm now going to hand it over to our last panelist, Ilio. Um, Ilio, you will have 15 minutes. Okay, hello, um, good morning, good evening, whatever you are in the world. My name is Elio Leturia, and I am a journalist at Columbia College Chicago. And uh, thank you very much for having me today sharing my work. I just want to warn you that the documentary that we are going to watch uh, it's, has language, and I just want to let you know beforehand. Um, my research was done in Chicago, and I spent six months, Monday through Friday, going every single night to take the train, um, the CTA train after midnight. And with that, with all the footage, sound, photos that I collected, I put together this experimental uh, documentary trying to showcase what racism is like and inequality in our world in times where we don't see it because people are sleeping mostly. And this started as a task that I um, took as a member of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee of Columbia College Chicago. Part of this uh, work is also due to the editor, who is name is James Moy, and also a Fulbright, a student from Uruguay who did the music especially for this film. So this is a collective work of different people from minority communities. And I would like to share this with you, which has been done in, with the purpose of showing to students as an educational tool and to provoke a conversation about what we see. And I'm going to now um, share my screen and we are going to be able to watch the short documentary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to all of our panelists and Elio, what, what a powerful note to end on. Thank you for sharing that. We, um, we've we had some questions submitted in, in the Q&A. So um, all panelists, if you'd like to um, unmute and turn on your cameras, we can begin to address those. Okay. Um, the first question we have um, from Barbara. In this panel, we hear about creativity, allowing ourselves to become vulnerable challenging insider versus outsider thinking. And finally, my story is the only thing I own. My question is how can we use all of these ideas to build bridges of understanding by asking, what is your story and embracing different stories? Kate, would you like to start? I mean, I think that the answer is in the question. What is, what is your story, you know? And just continue to ask that question. I was just talking to some students yesterday about interviewing methods and dance ethnography and talking about how to just ask them, what is their experience? Why do they love to dance? What is their story? And to just expand on that. I mean, I think, of course we could get into the details about what that would look like, but in general, ask people what their story is. Yeah, well, uh, personally for me, uh, when people want to engage in community work, it is very important to keep in mind the idea of building relationships. And that is something that we are learning from our indigenous communities and Chicana Latina feminists and black feminists that remind us about the importance of, be of building relationships first, right? When, um, and also to ask about the motivations behind your work. What are the reasons why you really want to engage in a specific kind of approach or a specific kind of community? Community because I think that uh, by exploring your own positionality and by exploring those motivations, you can really connect to the work with the communities. Uh, the other thing uh, that I would um, advise or what that I usually advise my mentees um, to do is to let go. I mean, researchers come with a lot of expectations into a specific field and I wanna, you know, take the stories, be respectful with the communities, right? Like you cannot co-opt the knowledge and just for the sake of publishing, you know, publication of books or anything. So you are 
coming to the communities and taking the knowledge and then becoming famous or popular or anything, but then not to give back to the community those knowledges, not to respect and not to negotiate uh, part of this, this, this um, process. So that's, um, and part of, finally, part of my, my, my learning process has to do with my self-transformation. So if we are not coming from a position of uh, vulnerability of, as Pandini was mentioning, right? Where we are also seeing ourselves as selves in relation that are, you know, to be questioned and critiqued. So then a uh, little transformation or, or, or some part of the transformation will be feasible, but still we can go beyond. Thank you. I'd like to piggyback on something that Nancy said uh, about our positionality, being in a constant state of self-reflection because our position impacts the way that we hear and receive those stories. So we have to be in that constant process of looking at who we are and how that's impacting the way that we're hearing stories because it's not fair for them, for us to ask our participants to be vulnerable and we aren't engaging in a similar process at the same time. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, important to keep in mind to, to be respectful and be able to give as much as we're asking for. And to add to that, I, I was going to, to talk about my experience and I'm just like beginning this journey of doing research in the United States. So I'm encountering this, uh, I'm struggling with bringing those uh, knowledge and those experience from the United States to Colombia, my country, because my first, like, like my purpose to go and do my PhD is to come back to Colombia and to bring all those, all the, these new experiences. But somehow I find myself in this uh, gray area where I'm telling my students in Colombia and my peers in Colombia something that I'm learning in the U.S. So I'm like, and they are, and they are challenging me. And they're asking me, why do we have to learn those things that you're learning there? And sometimes I, I just end up with no answers. So like I'm starting in that, in that positionality, in that metacognition, in that reflection process. Okay, so I want to build understanding of creativity in my country. What is, what is creativity for a, for a Colombian? What is creativity for a, a woman in Colombia, right? And, and that it's giving me a lot of, of passion and, and sometimes this moment of, of just fighting with myself, but I think that is the process. And also the thinking about multidisciplinarity and thinking about uh, uh, multiple ways of doing research that is related with your community, with traditions, with like ancient knowledge, ancient experience, you have to take that into uh, your research and how do you see the world and how do you want do you want to have an impact in the world? Uh, if I can join in here, uh, you know, coming from a country like India, we uh, which was a colony, so we've been you know colonized for more than two hundred years, and so you know the impact of that experience with us has one of the impacts is has been that you know we traditionally looked to native speaker countries of english such as the us or the uk as you know people as as countries with more knowledge better knowledge everything that we kind of we've been fed is been it's, it's so much more civilized so when you go there and then you see I mean, i'm talking about my experience as a fulbright scholar to the us you go there and then you see that beyond the stereotyping, there's so much more struggle. And then, you know, it's like coming full circle. So it's not, you know, the, what we see, the picture uh, that we read about or see is never the same until and unless you've been in the community, you've been a participant, and then you've been vulnerable, you've opened up, you do not really uh, appreciate the extent to which uh, everyday struggles uh, affect cultures and how also that affects research. So I find this a very, very rich kind of experience precisely because uh, when we open up and then we start moving into a space where we realize that, you know, there's no judgment. Uh, that's been a, a, a profound experience for me personally. Thank you for sharing. 
Um, Elio, I, I actually I have a question for you, and, and we've been getting some some questions about your documentary. I understand it took you a little over a year to film, um, you know, many nights going out. Um, would you be able to share a little bit more about your inspiration, the inspiration behind making the documentary, and also just you know the process of of gathering all the footage and and creating this um, powerful story? Well, it all started because I take the train to go to work every day and I work long hours and I live late. So I started observing how different it was the day from the night. And it was just a complete different people, I mean, groups of people that are there and they sleep and they eat and they, and then the dialogues and the conversations that I started hearing. And I came up with that idea saying, this is, this is the other side of, of the story that we don't, sometimes we don't want to see or we don't, we don't know. So started collecting the footage. Then I took a, a film class and I said, this could be my project. And then I did it regularly. I never skipped one single night during those six months, even though I, I collected for over a year, as you said. And then just putting together all these images, it was a little dangerous. I was caught three times shooting and people got upset, but I didn't want to like to pry. I, I wanted them to act the way that they were acting. And sometimes it was just hearing everything and you cannot do anything. But I was trying to document what I was seeing happening. I didn't make anything of this up, right? Of course, it didn't happen in just one night. I'm just putting, I was trying to put the, the, the spectator in that space and to feel that threat, to feel that anguish, to feel that fear and that, you know, that indifference. And is there one thing, or more, you can share more than one thing, but uh, what is the main thing you hope that uh, viewers take away from your documentary? Um, I just hope that they can see this as a collection of real stories that they have put together in a specific way. By the way, all has been shot with an iPhone. And of course the sound I had and, and other devices because sometimes I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't take, um, I mean, the, the sound, I just had to be close to the person and then record it. But I just would like people to see it as um, a tool for discussion. And then whether they agree, they disagree, some people are going to get offended. And I completely understand. I was heavily offended by all the things that I was hearing, but that is reality. And if we do not discuss, we don't talk, then things are going to be very difficult to change in terms of, of social you know, inequality and racism in this, in this society. So you're hoping this will spark a conversation and, and really inspire people to address these issues. That's correct. That's what I want, to, want people to do. When people, I, I haven't released it yet. This is the very first time that I show it to an audience. And I, you know, I plan to send it to documentary festivals and then see what happens. I just want to add that little disclaimer at the beginning, just because, but my students, when I show it, they just look at it and then I ask them because I agree with um, the, my, the, my colleague, the, I don't recall her name right now. It was talking about making yourself um, vulnerable. That's the way to connect to an audience, to connect with the students. If you are vulnerable, then they're going to, you are not in this position of talking to them. You are at the same and say, criticize me. I said, this is the time that you can, you know, just go, go for it. And then tell me what you think. Great. Well, we feel very privileged to be your first audience. Um, thank you yeah. for sharing that with us. Yeah. Okay, um, we, I see another question in the Q&A here um, from, Paul, a Fulbrighter to France, 1962. Um, this question is for Kate, Nancy, Padmini, and Lonika. The question is, um, with reference to its beginnings with Gregory Batson and Margaret Mean in Samoa and John Marshall, brother of Elizabeth Marshall, working in the Kalahari Desert in Africa, does cinematography have a role to play in your research? Yeah, I, I think I can start with that. Um, I'm in my dance research, I'm not a cinematographer or filmmaker in any way similar to um, Elio, you know, doing this beautiful work, but I certainly rely on video for my research. Um, I think we can think about archiving dance in various ways and trying to, you know, keep it using video or using notation systems or using notes or things like that. But 
you know, really, how do we archive embodied knowledge? It's through the body itself. The body is the primary source. And so thinking of video as a mnemonic device, you know, you can kind of remember the day that something happened um, is helpful and taking notes. But as dance, as a dance ethnographer, I really have to train my body to attend to the situation and the event in so many different ways, thinking about the big picture, the event itself, thinking about how I'm feeling, thinking about the movement itself. And of course, I'm interpreting all of this through my own body, right? And using conversations and um, other experiences to kind of triangulate this data that I'm, that I'm receiving through my body itself. Um, but as a dancer, really learning how to attend and use that and trust that as the receptacle for the archive in many ways, because traditionally that's how many of these, um, how many of these traditions are, are passed on. Um, so I think that, I think that's, that's important also, you know, doing video sometimes is not possible. When I was in Hisifi during carnival, it was not too smart to be, you know, waving a, an expensive camera around or even an iPhone, you know, it would have gotten snatched right away. So in a lot of ways, I, I can't rely on video. And so trusting the body, you know, as, as I said in my presentation, the body is everything. Uh, I'd like to uh, join Kate here and talk about, uh, you know, I just wanted to mention the fact that uh, what struck me from Elio's presentation is that you know you you do you use film you use visual images you you use <clears throat> photography but you do that uh, and it, you, not as uh, within the boundaries of research and that is why it's so real uh, I can you know I cannot like Kate uh, I cannot uh, imagine being allowed to record my students there, my participants, if, if that were, without, I mean, without a formal procedure in place where you take permission and all of that. And that kind of kills the creativity that we're talking about. So when, you, uh, when I see cinematography in our kind of research uh, as kind of uh, in an in-between space between formalized formal research tools and processes and the, the real, the messy, the the uh, you know the unregimented uh, life experiences that you have. So maybe you know in our kind of research that we do, if we do have the ability, the the possibility, the the resources and the uh, in the uh, the resources and uh, the opportunity to capture what we are doing, that's that's just great. But then you really need to you know maybe spend a whole year traveling by train in the middle of the night to be able to do that, to capture the real lessons. Otherwise, you know, these are the limitations that we face in the kind of research that we do. Yeah, if I may say what I, what I, what I do is I collect my data for that research that is going to be then, of course, interpreted in this case experimentally because everything is put in just one night. Um, and then just to uh, present it there and then expect a reaction, right? So that's, yeah, and then you have to put yourself there, you know, every single night. And that's part of the, uh, sometimes I would just, nothing happened tonight, but other days they were so heavily. So it's just, um, just a field, field, field research, I would say, yes. And I was talking about you before, uh, Panmini, when you said that you, you needed to make yourself vulnerable, I completely agree with you. Yeah, in my case, um, I have used video to not document the community processes that we have been developing. So I am not a you know cinematographer or an expert, but I rely a lot on arts because I me I think for me arts in general, you know, painting, dancing, and then video production is a way of healing, you know, and a way of bringing people's voices and stories into conversation. So I just shared in the chat a little experience that we had when 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 I was in the U.S. between twenty. 14 and 2017, there was all these, you know, presidential campaigns, there was a lot of pain, and I felt that I couldn't breathe, and my friends couldn't breathe. And then I, I was starting to think, okay, so what can I do? Uh, what can we do? Like my question always in, time, in times of tension is what's, what's to be done? So then I created this scenario that was called Under the Skin, 
uh, where we were bringing our stories as undocumented, as, as international scholars, as immigrants, etc. And we were using arts to heal. So we were painting, we were crafting, we were writing, we were doing all sorts of different things. So that is what eventually, this is space that was uh, mostly thought for 2016, fall 2016 became a space that we extended till 2017 for one more year until I came back to Colombia. So for those of you interested in seeing a little bit of the process, so I shared the link in the in the chat box. For me, cinematography does not play very much into what I do. I do take some videos and document things, but as um, Kate mentioned earlier, I was also in Recife and Olinda and surrounding areas, and it was not safe many times to have a camera out. Um, and also with me being on tenure track, there are certain ways in which I am expected to share the, uh, the research that I have that are more privileged. And unfortunately, I don't have the expertise or really the support to put anything into, um, in, into video form in a more organized way. So it doesn't play very much into what I do other than documenting uh, what I see when I can. Great, thank you for all of those responses. And um, I, there, I actually have a question for Carolina next. Um, Carolina, you, uh, your research interests center around how to foster creativity and innovation in learning environments. I'm sure um, a lot has had to be adapted during these last few months during the pandemic. I'm wondering if you can share um, you know, any advice you have about how we can continue to foster creativity and innovation in this new normal. I'm sure it's not the first time you, you've um, had this question, but hoping you can share some advice or maybe even some examples of you know, successful sparking of creativity and innovation in a virtual environment. Well, <laughs> that's a question that I, that I ask myself every day, right? And I was going to, before I answered that question, I was going to say that this, this space in we are today, that we are talking about our expertise is a creative environment. We are creating understanding. We are using our expertise to show people how to connect with others. How can uh, we understand others Right, so this is like the creative environment, and as I told, as I said in my presentation, and and you were discussing about the video, right? And you were like, no, I'm not, I'm not an expert on the video. If you're not an expert, if you don't have expertise on the video, it it your your video might not be the perfect video or a video that can really portray what you're trying to say, right? So. With creativity and innovation in this new normal, I think um, what well, Lanika was telling that ask better questions, right? Try to understand your audience or your students or even your family, the people that are around you, what are the needs that they have and try to talk about that needs. Okay, so if we have the, these needs, how can we improve if we want to improve? What do we need to know to improve what we are needing or the gaps that we are in? And how can our knowledge become that valuable part for transforming our own reality? If we transform our reality, the reality of the people that are around us must have an impact, must, I don't know if change, but you can have an impact on the people that you're working with or you're working um, around. So being creative is trying to get all those pieces of knowledge, of expertise, of experience and build common understanding, right? In this moment of chaos, you can find a uh, very creative experience in chaos because it's that moment when you really understand that you need something or the world needs something. I don't wanna be like, sound like selfish, but, but I really like, I really want to think about the impact that I'm gonna have in the world. But first I have to think of myself, how do I reflect on my experience and how my experience can impact on others. And I think that is, Creativity. There's a lot of things to talk about creativity there, but well, in a summary, that was it. Thank you. That's that's good advice for all of us. Thank you. Um, 
I, I wanted to direct one more question um, to uh, Lonika. You shared a very powerful takeaway um, that going out into another area and studying for a short period of time doesn't make us experts. Um, I don't have all the answers, but I do ask better questions. Is there any advice um, that you could share for um, you know, those who, who might be studying abroad in, in the future um, in terms of not viewing themselves as experts, but as constant learners um, in their respective fields? Um, hmm. I, I think that the nature of doing research itself, if it's done well, I think it, it supports that disposition in any way, because the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. And as you turn a corner to explore this more, then there are three or four more roads that you didn't even know existed. So taking that experience and realizing that there, all, there will always be another corner to turn, but also that what I am seeing and the way that I'm receiving it is from my perspective and it is couched within my experiences and I'm filtering it through a lens that may or may not even apply to this situation. Being in that, being in that constant state of, of self-reflection and always having that curiosity and always realizing that you don't know everything. I had, um, and I, I'm saying that, and it, it's something I'm thinking through because at the same time, I remember being in a car with another researcher and she was, when we were in Brazil and she was asking someone, about a particular type of music. And the response he gave didn't fall in line. She's not, she was from Canada. And the response she gave, he gave was not in line with her concept of it. So she kept asking him questions to get him to answer a certain way. And then afterwards she said, well, I was just picking at him. And I'm like, wait a minute, he grew up here. This is his music. And because he's not expressing it in the way that you read about in a book, it's invalid. Like we have to constantly realize that those things may come to the front of our mind. And no matter what we have seen in one particular area for a particular time, it may be totally different and totally valid right next door. So keeping that position, that disposition and always realizing who you are, looking at your position in this and not just taking it as a given, as a, as a given that you are an objective person because like, does that fully exist? And if I may add very quickly and following what you just said is when I, you know, I am an immigrant. When I came here, I, I always tell this as a joke. I said, I used to be white. And when I came here, I became a minority and I became a Latino. I had all these labels placed upon myself and all these doubts about how good my educational system was or so many things. And when I realized that in my, in my home country, I had been the oppressor and I had been the white person looking down on people, then I said, wow, now the roles have reversed. Now I am feeling what I have done. And that made me feel really bad. So I acknowledge that and I have tried to undo it by recognizing every day the things that I may think that it may cross my mind and say, don't do it that way. You know, this is how media, how your parents, your society taught you, you know, move, change. But not everybody has had that experience. And I joke again, uh, I, I joke sometimes saying, I want to be white again, because it feels so good to have privilege. Yeah, I also want to add to what Monique. I just want to add really quickly to what Lonika was saying um, and about kind of having these contradictions in the research, like different perspectives. And maybe what the woman in Canada had read was not necessarily invalid, but it was a different perspective, you know, and that Uber driver might have had a totally different, you know, perspective of a, as another Uber driver. And so allowing the research to sit with those contradictions. And I think that especially when working with young people, when I work with college students to teach them how to do ethnographic methods, um, the research really has to be about asking more questions. And many young people come into the research thinking that the point of research is to answer questions. But like Lonika was saying, like it's all about just asking better questions all the time and acknowledging the assumptions that you come with, acknowledging the biases that you have and 
not necessarily fighting them. Some of them might be dangerous and they should definitely be challenged, but reflecting on them and coming into an experience and saying, huh, wow, I wonder why I have that perspective. Why do I have that assumption? And then constantly questioning that and trying to figure out other ways of, of listening, which is by asking people what their stories are and asking for their perspectives. Yeah, I'd like to add just one final, Melanie, one final final. comment. Um, um, and then is, is this, uh, this is a good ending for us to remind ourselves that we have the two forces, oppressor and oppressed, operating in us, right? So the idea is for us to be self-analytical in the spaces and the scenarios in which we can become also oppressors to other communities. So that's an important reminder. And finally, for me to engage in community or in any type of interaction, the key question that I ask is, where are we speaking from and how are we engaging in listening? If we do it from a judgmental space, little space for construction is possible, according to my experience. So yeah, that, those final messages to just monitor ourselves on, on our power relationships, the oppressor and oppressed dimensions that we have in us, all of us, and then how we listen and how we talk and where we are speaking from as well. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing all of these personal stories. I, I think all of these stories are a reminder of um, just the power of the Fulbright program and its mission to uh, using international exchange to promote mutual understanding among cultures worldwide and just how um, now that's more important than ever. Um, so thank you. I think that was a, a great note to end on. Um, I, I thank all of our panelists um, for sharing all their exciting work and stories today. Um, I also want to thank the Fulbright Association staff. They've been making everything work seamlessly on the back end. We've had no glitches, which is amazing. Um, and I also thank all of the, um, everyone who is listening today from our community. Um, we, this could not have happened without your support. I hope everybody enjoys the rest of the conference. Thank you.